Okay, well, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, and now know that Jean is not in, in France. Uh, good morning, you know, no one's good evening <laughs> for folks. Um, welcome back to the, the second day. Uh, I thank you to all of the people who helped make yesterday go really well, all of the MCHB staff, uh, the note takers who really did a nice job of getting me information much sooner than I thought I was going to get the notes. And then certainly the people who led the, um, the breakout sessions have gotten me information. So I uh, uh, stayed up late putting all of that stuff together and, and sent you what sort of a compilation of the efforts, um, which will, I hope, give us uh, enough background and foundation for our conversation today. Uh, just as a start, it's, I'm always curious about why things happen when they do. Um, you know, why did Walter Mondale choose to die yesterday at 93? Walter Mondale, the former vice president, senator from Minnesota. And it struck me that in this week when we're having a whole bunch of, of civil unrest uh, related to racial dis disparities, and this week when we're having uh, Earth Day, celebrating Earth Day, that Walter Mondale, who was a champion of women's rights, civil rights, and environmental justice, uh, you know, chose to make an exit from this world and really highlighted the fact that an individual working within the system of policymaking at the, the state level, he was attorney general here and at the, at the Congress and, and both as a senator and then as vice president and then as ambassador, you can really have an impact you can really change things for the better. And he was engaged in a lot of civil rights legislation, uh, authored the Fair Housing Act, um, you know, was involved with a lot of environmental issues. So uh, I thank Walter Mondale for the, the good role modeling he did as a public servant. And, and we'll, I'll keep him in mind here in Minnesota as he was a big hero here uh, as we move forward on this day. Uh, we're gonna start out with a, a video um, from the Delaware Department of Health. Last week, I, I gave a presentation to their, uh, the Delaware Maternal Infant Care Consortium, Mother and Infant Consortium, uh, and they, they put together a video that I thought was really impressive, and it followed a lot about what CDC is doing in, in, with Hear Her. Um, and I think you know, it, it follows that same format. And so I thought it would be nice to have this voice from the community from, from Delaware. And yes, it is. It's specifically focused on Delaware because that's what the, the the purpose was. But you'll see that it is relevant to all of us in all parts of our country. Um, so, uh, Vincent, uh, Robert, let's hear she the video. wonderful brown children and I'm really excited to be here to have this conversation around black maternal health because it's an epidemic that although it's, it's recognized in our country it oftentimes goes unintervened. As black women we are not the people who are at fault for this for this issue of infant mortality rates being high in our community and maternal mortality rates being high in our community. It's a system set up against us the first time I heard that black women were three times more likely to die because of maternal health issues was scary. I know my weight 100%. 
made it so that doctors only saw one thing when I walked in the door. I think the fact that I am a black woman added on top of that like tenfold. Um, I suffered from postpartum anxiety and those panic attacks lasted for weeks after pregnancy. Your maternal health matters now, whether it's when you want to have a baby in five years or 10 years that you need to focus on that right now. Be mindful of your health. Just be conscious of what you're eating, exercise. Start reaching out to get medical care, um, whether it's primary care or just seeing a gynecologist and weeding through and see who like is the best fit for you. I didn't feel heard. I didn't feel like I was respected. I just really felt like they, like she looked at me as I'm just a young black girl in here pregnant. They judge that whenever you're in there by yourself but it's like I actually had my fiance with me. I felt when I first came to them that I was a statistic. And here is this woman who uh, doesn't have the man in her life who's coming here pregnant with her mother to seek help. I left out of there feeling dismissed and thank God that I know that I have the power to do this. I picked up the phone and I called out of network and made an appointment somewhere else. I think that no one really cared about whether I got the care I needed. The color of my skin and my weight just, just added up. If a medical provider is disturbing you, not making you feel uncomfortable, you have the right when you're in the hospital to tell them, I do not want to work with this person. People think that they have to suffer through those things. As a physician, as an African American woman, I am just truly terrified and hope that we are able to find comprehensive, productive strategies to decrease maternal health mortality and disparities because I hope that one day I'm able to have a successful pregnancy and I don't want implicit biases or racism to affect the chances of my health as well as the health of my newborn. There were a lot of moments where I thought we have a long way to go and the gate is not open to everybody. We still have to be so attentive to our own needs before someone actually takes compassion for us as a people. I thought I was gonna die. Right. I've had complications with both of my pregnancies that were preventable. It's sad and it's heartbreaking because I don't want other women to go through what I went through in my pregnancies. I wrote a letter saying who I wanted to take care of my daughter. I have to advocate for myself and then I have to basically do my own research before I walk anywhere near a doctor's office. I need to be prepared way more than just having my insurance card and an ID. I learned from my weight loss journey, trying to seek uh, medical help for that was, the, was actually the pillar for me actually taking charge with my birthing journey. It is alarming that you feel that pressure that now with me bringing a little girl in the world that you'd hope that that little girl when she's my age or younger and she's not going to experience the same thing that I went through. When I saw that video, it just, it's, you know, you, we hear about weathering and toxic stress. It just struck me that these women in Delaware and black women in Delaware, and I suspect throughout the country, just have to worry every day with their health care. And it, it must just be overwhelmingly stressful. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering about your take. I don't know if you've seen this video before, but your, your impressions of the video. Yes, I, I think that it's really a wonderful video and we're seeing um, other locations, jurisdictions and organizations really trying to um, give voice to women through these messages. And um, the materials that we have um, available to hear her is, is open to the public and people can use it and tailor it into a way that they see fit. We are trying to continue uh, sharing the message and are now exploring the opportunity to work with the National Indian Health Board so that we can broaden our messages to um, American Indian Alaska Native women. So um, again, there, there's, it, there is this real importance to 
uh, share this message. And again, uh, seeing other groups uh, do this is really great. Any comments from other members of the committee? No, but you know, in North Carolina, we're um, in the process of uh, coming up, rolling our, our own version of the CDC URL campaign and um, have really listened to the individuals with lived experience that are on our maternal health task force because they have their own stories to share. One of the ladies did share her story in one of our earlier SACOM meetings. And so I think um, the more we will just listen, um, um, the better off we will all be. And I think we struggle with listening for some reason, but these are people's personal stories. This is their lives and this is what they have to live with. And if we're not listening, I think our challenge is we're just adding even more stress to their lives. And so I think, um, you know, as many people as possible and that can be exposed to and from the provider side, as well as from the women's side, um, the CDC through her campaign or whatever version of it that, that communities choose to use, I think it will be a, a big help to all. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you sharing the Delaware one. Yeah, well, it was interesting because they have a state rep who started out that, you know, who actually moderated that and a physician who's well known in the community who also has these concerns. So that helps to really say this is not just about those poor women. I mean, it is, it's the, the, the strong and powerful black women who are also having it. And so it's I mean, my encourage folks is that if you can get those voices out there, that helps to, to magnify the message. Right. We have a North Carolina representative that um an African-American uh, young woman who just um, issued a, a North Carolina version of the Momnibus Act in North Carolina. So it's a bill um, that I reviewed two weeks ago. Um, and as you know, um, uh, Congresswoman Alma Adams, um, who has sponsored much of the Momnibus um, bills at the national level in Congress is from North Carolina. So she has always been a strong advocate for women's health and specifically maternal health. So we feel fortunate um, that we do have that level of support. Now, the, the question is, what do we do with it? Because that's the next big piece is, you know, you can have that support, but we know we've got some legislative support at multiple levels. So we're excited about the opportunities. Great. Any other comments from task force members? I, I see in the chat, somebody has this video public. I, I think the Delaware folks are pretty open to sharing it. I, I can't speak for them, but they were very said, you know, get it out and, and they were anxious to get feedback. So my guess is that they're, they're gonna use this as broadly as they can. And this is Lee, I have a, I have a question. Um, and this is just coming out of, coming at it from an observer standpoint. We've been having a lot of discussions internally um, about discussions around weathering race, all of that, and um, concerns about how the discussion helps to promote um, sort of active um, sort of uh, defense of you as, a, as an individual and your, your rights, your needs, but also how having the discussion sometimes has the potential to further traumatize. And I, I, I guess the question that I'm bringing to videos like this is I watch them um, and I, I very much appreciate respect and think it's necessary for um, women to advocate for themselves. And I'm wondering um, what the thinking is on the other side as to how we message this in a way that they should um, not go in or assume that the situation is going to be um, stacked against them um, in the event that that might give them more anxiety. Um, and I know that there are people who specialize in this sort of messaging, but can, can folks speak to that? Help me understand that. I will leave that to Dr. Barfield. My guess is that you guys looked at that those issues in, in putting out the Hear Her campaign. Yeah, so there was a, a there's a lot of consideration here in terms of, you know, the, the, the messaging to make sure that um, we're providing information, but that we also aren't traumatizing people. We're also trying to, of course, be incredibly respectful. And there's a variety of stories. So, for example, last week, as part of Black Maternal Health Week, um, I interviewed uh, Allison Felix, who's an Olympic athlete. Um, 
and in California and is incredible. And hers, she had a story of a pregnancy related um, complication, but in her case, fortunately, her providers actually noted and discovered it. And so she wanted to also share that aspect. So, you know, trying to give some balance in the fact that there are warning signs um, that all of us have a role to play in terms of helping to identify these warning signs, um, loved ones around us, as well as providers that we see. Thank you. I, I just, I, I, I hope that we are not creating a situation where um, we're sort of um, putting everybody on alert about many, many healthcare providers who are very attentive and trying very hard to do the right thing and um, to make women feel both empowered and the need to be well-informed, so. I, I think it's a, a, a good point. And I always, when I, when I talk about public health, I always have two definitions of public health. One is public health is the constant redefinition of the unacceptable. And we're really good at that, pointing out all of the problems that are there, the things that are unacceptable, the things that are given that should be intolerable. The other definition is, Public health is what we do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy, the more positive aspects. So I think there's, we always have to balance, yeah, pointing out the problems, but then also pointing out some of the solutions that, that how do we move forward? And so I think in any of these campaigns, there need, I think does need to be a balance. So thank you for bringing that up, Lee. Thoughts from anybody else? All right. Uh, then let's move on. And Dr. Warren, let's give a, a federal update. Um, and so we're, we're actually, I'm labeling these things as federal updates because um, there, there are other people within the federal government that we need to hear from. And so we're kind of setting the stage for down the road, being able to make sure we get the input from as many places as we can within the, the federal bureaucracy. So Dr. Warren, it's yours. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon to the committee. Um, am I sharing my slides or Looks like someone is sharing them, perfect. Um, so I'm gonna give you some high level updates from HRSA and from the Bureau specifically. We'll go to the next slide. Um, I'll start with the Bureau, give you a bit of an update on where we are with strategic planning, our equity work um, and COVID response activities. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, we have mentioned to you all before that um, we are moving through our strategic planning process. We will be unveiling our strategic goals and objectives <clears throat> in May. Um, the plan is to unveil them at the AMSHIP meeting. And so look forward to you all hearing uh, those. Really appreciate the thoughtful input that has gone into those. Um, we've had um, many, many listening sessions, focus groups, key informant interviews, um, a comprehensive environmental scan, a review of a number of publications, uh, both peer-reviewed publications, as well as uh, reports from uh, national organizations, stakeholders, et cetera, um, that have gone into this. So we're really pleased with where this has ended up and look forward to sharing it um, later this year, uh, next month, actually. And then we will work on uh, plan implementation and evaluation moving forward after that. Uh, next slide, please. This just gives you a sense of some of the, um, the activities that have happened. We've ended up um, with, as I said, um, lots of stakeholder engagement, um, engagement of our own staff as well, a public facing request for information process, um, looking at um, a number of documents that existed and hearing from thousands of stakeholders, uh, really trying to cover the spread of the MCH population. Um, so that we can make sure we have that input. So thank you and look forward to sharing that uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. Um, as we continue to um, further our commitment to uh, advancing equity in the MCH population, uh, we're also looking at where we've got opportunities internally. Um, so for the last four months, we have had um, the Deputy Director of HRSA's Office of Civil Rights, Diversity and Inclusion, uh, doing a detail with MCHB uh, to really guide our equity work and to inform uh, Bureau leadership of some opportunities. 
Um, she has developed a framework which we've shared with our team um, about our approach and divides it into these three buckets, our people, our organization, and our partners. Um, the our people piece, uh, as it sounds, is a more internal facing piece um, where we've got opportunities for continuous learning for staff, um, where we look at ways where we can diversify our staff and create a culture of inclusion. When it comes to organization, uh, that really helps us think about what our policies, our structures are, um, how we equ incorporate equity, integrate equity into all of our work. And so this is not just the work of a DTLE or one person or one office within the Bureau. It really becomes the work that we all do and it becomes integrated into everything that we do. Um, and then finally, our partners. And so how do we, um, through this work, engage the field? Um, specifically, how do we center and amplify the experiences of women and families, particularly those of color? Um, how do we listen to and learn from the field, including folks that we've not historically listened to? Um, and then where are there opportunities to provide leadership for the field? Um, so we're excited to further integrate this uh, framework into our work. Our strategic plan is going to have a heavy focus on equity. Um, and um, the expectation moving forward is that as we publish NOFOs, as we design programs, um, that we are incorporating an equity lens um, to the extent that we can. And so really excited about that and moving it forward um, and wanted you all to, to be aware of that. Next slide, please. We've also now, um, as with all our federal colleagues for over a year, been um, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the HRSA response has been much broader. I'm gonna to talk to you specifically about what we've been doing in the Bureau. Um, uh, last year, uh, starting in the late spring, summer and continuing through much of the year, um, we were responding to challenges, what I consider some of the collateral um, complications of COVID. So um, early on in the pandemic, as there was the message to stay home unless you're, you're really, really ill, don't seek medical care, um, lots of people took that to heart, and that included parents with young children who needed well visits and immunizations. Um, so over the course of the spring, uh, summer, and into the fall, um, we really pushed um, to promote well visits and immunizations, recognizing that um, it's more than just getting those vaccines. It's an opportunity to check in with families um, on what their needs are related to a variety of social determinants, to connect them with community resources, um, and to, to think about screening for, for um, concerning activities, things like adverse childhood experiences. Uh, so lots of kids and families were missing out on those. Um, and so the Well Child Wednesdays uh, campaign was an opportunity to help promote that. Um, we also recognize that um, the way we typically fund things is often more reactive than proactive. And um, sometimes uh, states and communities um, need to be able to build some capacity to be able to respond to needs that are emerging before they actually emerge. And so uh, we spent some time working with our legal counsel and grants folks to understand how we could craft a grant opportunity that would be really open-ended. Um, and we ended up with our emerging issues in maternal and child health NOFO um, that was published. We were able to set aside a million and a half dollars um, through our SPRANs, our, our special projects of regional and national significance um, to be able to support this. Um, we got a number of applications, a lot of interest in this funding opportunity. We'll be announcing um, the recipients of that later this year. Um, I hope that is something, um, if, if this bears out the way we think it's going to, I hope that's something we'd be able to support moving forward um, to really bolster the capacity of states and communities to, to be prepared to deal with emerging issues. Um, and an example emerging issue uh, is the next item, our P4 challenge are promoting uh, pediatric primary prevention. So we've used these prize challenge competitions um, in a number of ways recently. Um, so we are finishing up four what we call grand challenges. So one on childhood obesity, one on care coordination for kids with special health care needs, um, one on remote pregnancy monitoring, and one on um, optimizing care for pregnant women and new moms with opioid use disorder. And the way these challenges work is you put out a call um, around a particular topic. You ask people to submit bright ideas. Um, the goal is to get people who aren't necessarily the typical applicants to our grant opportunities. Um, and we get a wide range of ideas and uh, the bar for entry is very low. It's typically a three to five page application. 
And so much different than our normal 60 or 80 page grant application. Um, and folks submit those applications of a round of winners are picked. They get a little bit of seed money to implement their idea or plan. Uh, they come back with results. We then pick additional winners based on that. Um, so based on the success of prior challenges, we launched our P4 challenge last summer um, or last fall, I should say. This is to really get people thinking about how we can innovate in the space of well visits and immunizations, recognizing the decline um, we've seen in those in the pandemic. And we were able to set aside a million dollars uh, for the prize purse there. On the next slide, you'll see that we got um, uh, entries. Well, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So on the, the challenge, I mentioned the prize purse. Um, we got 241 submissions from across the country. We're in the process right now of selecting up to 50 phase one winners. Um, they will all get $10,000 each to implement the, the idea they proposed. Um, they'll have six months to do that, and then we'll pick 20 of those to be phase two winners, and they'll get $25,000 each. Um, the ask was that they partner with community-based organizations, um, public health, uh, immunization programs, uh, family serving entities, other partners that may be unique to their communities to really think about approaches to this. Um, and so we will look forward to announcing those winners in May. Um, I think the next slide shows a map and you'll see um, all across the country where the submissions came from. So all but a handful of states submitted applications, um, 44 states, 193 cities, and uh, two applications also from uh, Puerto Rico. So really appreciate the response to this and all the work that has gone into uh, judging really quickly those 241 applications. And again, soon we'll be announcing uh, those 50 winners. Next slide, please. Uh, and we've talked about that. We'll go ahead one more. So uh, early on in the pandemic response, when the CARES Act passed, so this was one of the earlier COVID supplemental bills, uh, there was $15 million made available to MCHB to support telehealth activities. Um, and we made four awards in the areas you see on your screen. So maternal health, pediatric care, um, state public health systems, and family engagement. Um, I want to talk briefly about the maternal health investment. The recipient of that was the University of North Carolina um, at Chapel Hill. Um, next slide. They have, uh, with these funds, uh, supported their maternal telehealth access project. So the goal of this was to increase telehealth access um, and help build that infrastructure, both on the provider and on the, the patient side, um, with an overarching goal of improving access to maternity care. Um, and that was inclusive of uh, mental health care, specifically during the pandemic, but building some foundations that could serve us um, well beyond that. On the next slide, um, one of the first things that the grantee did was to conduct a very robust needs assessment to understand some of the barriers uh, to implementing telehealth and to understand where there were the areas of greatest need. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side of this slide, a number of barriers that were identified, um, some of them um, very familiar to us with other MCH challenges as we think about social um, determinants, um, some uh, as, relates to telehealth, things like low digital literacy or lack of access to internet, um, lack of technology and knowledge, things that we saw actually with some of our programs as we were implementing, for example, home visiting and Healthy Start transitioning over to virtual services, um, recognizing that in some communities um, there wasn't access to uh, reliable internet service or broadband, um, or maybe there was, but families didn't have devices or in some cases both. Um, so a lot of these barriers rose to the top in this needs assessment. Um, and the, the folks at UNC um, have identified their plan of action for moving forward with a variety of partners um, to help address these. And again, to think about how they reach populations with um, the greatest needs. So on the next slide, just a few examples of the things they are doing. Um, some of their funding is going to support remote pregnancy monitoring, things like um, home blood pressure monitoring. Um, they're supporting um, technology for both patients and providers um, that allow them to access telemedicine. Uh, they're supporting training uh, for a variety of um, folks in the workforce, specifically on how to do this work in a virtual setting. So doulas, lactation consultants, community health workers. Um, and then they are also supporting 
um, actual direct services uh, being done in a virtual setting. So um, we are excited to learn more about this work as it continues. The first part of this project, as I mentioned, was really focused on better understanding the need and where to go. Um, and now they are in an implementation phase. So appreciate the partnership with the folks at UNC. Um, they've done great work to date and we'll look forward to keeping you all updated uh, as we move forward and, and sharing lessons learned. Next slide, please. So as we look ahead, um, thinking about where the department is focusing and thinking about where there are needs with MCH populations, um, wanted to share a few of those ideas with you. Um, we're actually convening a meeting on Monday um, with, uh, in partnership with ASTHO, um, engaging a number of state representatives, um, representatives from state public health agencies, for example, Title V and Children and Youth with Special Health Care Need programs. Um, as well as uh, national stakeholder, stakeholder organizations um, and, and a number of federal partners will be coming together to really understand um, what has happened to date in the response and what are the lessons learned as we look ahead, um, particularly as it relates to the MCH population. So as a very concrete example, um, vaccines for adolescents are, are pretty close on the horizon. What can we learn from the adult vaccination work that has happened to date um, that will help inform that and, and make sure that we're meeting the needs um, of adolescents? Um, eventually, vaccines will be available for younger children as well. Um, what are considerations for pregnant women as we try to continue to, to have that conversation and make vaccines available for pregnant women? So um, that meeting will be next Monday and will help inform our efforts as well. Um, but we, we're looking in several buckets. One, around vaccination. How do we support vaccine delivery through MCHB funded staff? So a lot of our staff at the state levels um, have been deployed to work on the public health response. That is not new. Um, I, I would say it shifted over the course of the pandemic in terms of what those folks are actually doing, but a lot of MCHB funded staff um, in states are actually now being um, uh, deployed to work in vaccination clinics and sites. Um, uh, we also have an opportunity to think about how we train MCHB funded staff on messaging strategies for MCH populations. So again, what are some of those lessons learned from adult vaccinations uh, that can be applied to um, uh, pediatric populations, children with special health care needs? Uh, where are there remaining needs around messaging for pregnant women that we can help fill? And then uh, many of our programs, Title V and some of our community-based programs, uh, work to educate families about how they can access vaccines um, in their community. So a lot of that connection work uh, going on, and that will continue. Uh, with regards to testing and tracing and activities to reduce the spread, um, as I mentioned, our community-based programs help to connect families um, who may need testing uh, with where those are available in their communities. Um, programs like Home Visiting and Healthy Start, Clinical services that are funded through Title V, of course, uh, promote activities that we know help reduce the spread. Um, and then states are using their funds to continue to support telehealth efforts. And, and I mentioned earlier the activities that we're supporting um, at the federal level in those, those four areas of uh, maternal health, pediatric care, uh, family engagement, and then state public health systems. And then finally, thinking about where there are needs related to surveillance and research. So um, as you all know, we fund the National Survey of Children's Health. It's a national survey that is representative um, with uh, estimates both at the national and state levels. Um, it is conducted annually. This used to be an every four-year survey. Now it's done uh, once a year and really gives us an idea of a broad range of indicators related to child and family well-being. And we are adding COVID-19 questions to that, um, recognizing that those don't happen immediately, but it will give us a good opportunity uh, to do a before and after look moving forward um, at the response to families um, uh, before and after COVID. Um, we also have partnered with the Census Bureau for a much more real-time data collection activity. Um, so starting at the beginning of April, there were questions added to the Household Pulse Survey um, to ask questions specifically about um, child care, about um, access to telehealth, and about missed preventive care. Those questions will be uh, run through the end of June, I believe, um, and are available um, much more frequently. They'll be available a number of times uh, between April and June 
Um, and that will give us a more real-time look at what's going on. It's a much smaller sample, so you have to be mindful of the interpretations there, uh, but it gives us a, a, at least some data around what families with children are navigating. Um, and then we are continuously looking at ways that we can uh, partner with colleagues, for example, colleagues at NICHD, around how we do some long-term follow-up of pediatric patients with COVID-19 through the various research networks that we fund. Next slide, please. So a few updates from the department and HRSA level, um, and um, we'll dive into those next slide. So in terms of leadership updates, um, since we last convened, we now have a secretary, Javier Becerra um, is our secretary and has been here for about a month, uh, actually this week. Um, we also have a confirmed assistant secretary, Dr. Rachel Levine. Um, and a number of other nominees uh, continue to move forward, as you all are, are hearing in the news. Um, at the HRSA level, we do not yet have an administrator. We have um, our uh, deputy administrator, Diana Espinosa, is serving as our uh, acting administrator. Um, and we also have a new chief of staff, Jordan Grossman, um, who was appointed after uh, the inauguration. Next slide. Um, HRSA is continuing to, um, uh, to respond to new funding that was available in the American Rescue Plan. Um, so just under $18 billion uh, appropriated for HRSA in that plan. And you can see here um, a number of the activities that were funded. Some of these have been released. Uh, some of these are still in the process of being released. So um, I always tell folks the most up-to-date place to go for information um, is either to the hrsa.gov website and look for funding opportunities or grants.gov uh, because before those are released, we can't talk specifically about what the content of those is going to be. Um, I will call out that for uh, MCHB, there was $150 million added uh, to the McV, the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program, um, and then $80 million for the Pediatric Mental Health Care Access Program. So we will be working um, to uh, make those funding opportunities available um, very soon. So stay tuned uh, for that. You can see throughout the rest of the agency, a huge investment um, in the health centers, the community health centers, um, but also money for workforce activities uh, that you see listed there, uh, and then for rural health activities as well. Next slide, please. Also wanted to make sure that you all um, saw the presidential proclamation for Black Maternal Health Week last week um, and social media. So I've got the links there for you in case you missed that. Um, similar efforts at the department level on the next slide. Uh, the secretary um, uh, made video remarks and also um, there was an announcement through the department about the, um, the extension of Medicaid benefits in Illinois being extended uh, up to one year postpartum with full Medicaid benefits uh, for, for women for the entire first year after delivery. Um, and then also uh, the department announced the new funding opportunity for the Our Moms program, the Rural Maternity and Obstetrics Management Strategies program um, that will have some increased focus this round on um, equity and populations that have historically suffered uh, from worse health outcomes and health disparities and other inequities. Um, so the link for that also is there and encourage you to check that out. Um, also within the Bureau last week, we hosted Dr. Zia Malawa uh, from San Francisco. She is well known to many of you on this committee um, and she um, spent some time talking with our team, um, understanding the historical roots of inequities um, and also helping us to think about racism as a root cause and how that might apply uh, to some of our programming work moving forward. Next slide, please. Uh, and that's it. So thank you. I'm happy to answer if you've got questions. All right, any questions from folks? Uh, yes, I have a question, um, if nobody else does. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. Um, Michael, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, first, a couple of comments and then a final question. Um, so in regard to COVID vaccines in children, um, I've been doing a lot of research on this and children are in the lowest risk group for viral infection and COVID-19 disease. And there is no solid evidence right now that children transmit the virus to adults and that vaccination reduces viral transmission. So I know that there is increased interest in including children in these uh, clinical trials. I know Moderna and Pfizer have already begun this. 
Um, but current findings suggest that vaccination may not offer much additional protection, and there's no scientific evidence that supports the administration of the COVID-19 vaccine to children. So I'm very curious as to why this is why this is seen as a priority right now, because I think I, I am concerned from a scientific perspective that it's not really warranted. And so I think we just have to be ready that there are gonna be several families that are not going to be interested in vaccinating their children just based on science alone. So I'm interested in your thoughts regarding that. So on the, so I think there are two things to think about with the immunization. So the, the big push we're doing at the moment is around routine immunization. So not COVID-19 vaccine, but um, we've seen a dramatic decline in the routine pediatric immunizations um, because kids have not been coming in for well visits. So that's been a big priority to date for us. Our colleagues at CDC have shown there's about a million and a half fewer measles containing doses, for example, of vaccine um, in terms of a deficit since the start of the pandemic. So uh, a major push for us right now is to get kids and families back in for those well visits so they can get caught up on those routine immunizations. Related to that, as adolescent COVID-19 vaccine becomes available, uh, maybe later this summer or in the fall, um, right now those vaccines can't be co-administered with routine immunizations. And so um, the opportunity for adolescents to get the tetanus uh, booster that they normally get, the meningitis vaccine and HPV vaccines, there's worry that if, if families wait until the regular back to school time in August, uh, to come in and COVID-19 vaccine is available and they want that, that they've missed an opportunity to get those routine immunizations. So routine immunizations is, is one bucket. Um, the COVID vaccines are the other. And so we are certainly watching um, the research that is happening. Um, and also uh, once that is, is further along, um, my assumption is that our colleagues at CDC and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices uh, will meet and, recommendation and make recommendations and then we will go from there. Um, so at this point, we're trying to anticipate and understand what are the lessons that we've learned to date uh, so that as the research moves along, so those recommendations come along, uh, we are poised and, and ready to act on those. So that's that's where we are with regards to the, the COVID-19 vaccines. Okay, so right now kind of a wait and see, but be ready in case if the CDC recommends it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions that folks have or comments? I'm just curious, Dr. Warren, in your strategic planning, how did SACOM fit into that strategic plan? Does it fit into that strategic plan? It does. And so a number of folks were involved in uh, the interviews or listening sessions. Um, certainly infant mortality has, has long been uh, one of those um, sort of bellwether outcomes that the Bureau has looked at. I mean, if you think back to the, the founding of the Bureau in 1912, really the first thing they focused on nationally uh, was infant mortality. Um, and so I think what you will see when we unveil that plan is that the, the uh, main goals and the objectives uh, really support our work continuing in this area. Um, one of our challenges was as a bureau, we have 11 different legislative authorities, um, things that are as broad as uh, Title V and McVie and Healthy Start and as focused and specific as autism and sickle cell. And so um, we had to fit all of those things in one strategic plan. And so um, it is necessarily broad, uh, but I think the folks on this committee will be pleased with where we landed, uh, particularly with the emphasis on equity, um, but also on a number of the other items that you all have been talking about recently. So I won't spoil the surprise, but we will be happy to share that very soon. Good, thanks. Uh, one other question I have with the American Rescue Plan, with the dollars that are coming to HRSA, uh, you'll see in our recommendations that were, we drafted over the last day and, and we'll be discussing, some of it is to say, can, we, can some of those dollars actually be encouraged to focus on maternal and child health issues at the you know, community health center level and, and some of the other places? Are you doing some internal sort of advocacy uh, for in HRSA to focus some of those uh, whatever the $18 billion uh, to have a, a more MCH focus? So we always are. I would say we take always take the opportunity anytime there's funding to think where there is an MCH lens that can be applied. Um, one thing I would say is as, um, as funding becomes available to states, one of the things that I'm recognizing is that 
Um, it's coming from different places within the federal government. So states are getting funding for similar topics, but from different parts of HHS or even different um, departments altogether. Um, and so I think there is going to be um, an opportunity for us to hear from the states about where some of those um, overlaps are, if you will. It's not duplication of funding, but it's related funding. Um, and is there guidance that they need from us on how to connect those streams? So for example, um, there may be funds going around uh, school health through, um, uh, through HHS that end up going to state health agencies but the Department of Education may also have some going to state education agencies. And uh, folks in those agencies at the state level don't always talk to each other about their incoming funding streams and where there are opportunities to connect, even though they've really got shared goals. And so I think if you all see those kinds of examples where on the ground there are related funding streams and folks aren't making the connections, um, and it would benefit, for example, from us um, giving people examples of how they can work together across agencies, we'd be, we'd be happy to do that. We're trying to think proactively where those might be, uh, but inevitably some of those are going to happen. And if, if folks feel like they need um, support from the federal partners, we are happy to, to engage other folks within HHS or folks across the, the scope of federal government to think about that. And in, in some of my conversations with Title V directors, they say, well, we're losing staff because they're going into COVID activities. And I say, well, that's an opportunity actually, because you can bring an MCH lens to some of those other things and actually use it to recruit more people working on, on COVID to be MCH uh, advocates as well. Absolutely. Uh, I see Tara has her hand up and Dr. Barfield has her hand up. Nope, that was just from before. Sorry about that, Ed. Okay. Uh, and I know Dr. Barfield has some, you're going to have a little presentation, short presentation also. So uh, yeah. I don't have a question and then we can get to your. Yeah. And maybe loading the, the slides while uh, the questions. Um, so just to add to what uh, Dr. Warren was saying, I think there is an opportunity also for MCH leadership to think more broadly, particularly around areas of health equity and social determinants of health. And there is um, more funding that's coming out in those areas. We just need to think about how the MCH population should be included. I mean, if we think about you know, our discussion earlier and the implications that women are having, for example, with regard to maternal health, it isn't just about maternal specific issues. These are broader social determinants. And to the degree that we can make sure that um, outcomes for mothers and infants are measured in these broader uh, legislation, I think we'll all benefit. Good. Yeah, um, so, so now tell us about the PRAMS changes. Yes. So I'm really excited, everyone, to talk about the PRAMS uh, survey questionnaire revision. And I just wanted to, one, inform the committee on opportunities uh, to um, inform us and also to um, help us understand more about evolving issues in maternal and infant health that we should think about and incorporate into the survey. Next slide, please. So just a quick review for those of you who aren't aware, PRAMS is a population-based uh, system that asks uh, maternal behaviors and experiences around the time of pregnancy it's a postpartum survey done about uh, two to six months after delivery, and it supplements information on the birth certificate because it's linked, and uh, it has an opportunity to approximate uh, state and near national estimates. And currently, uh, we have um, 50 sites, and um, in the next funding uh, cycle, we will also have 50 sites. Um, and there's more information on the website as listed here below. Next slide. So we've gone through several phases since the um, survey began in 1987 and we're now on phase nine and that's due to launch in 2023. Um, but the process in, involves comprehensive inventory of the current questions as well as the opportunity to uh, consider new questions and topic areas. Next slide. So this is just a summary of what we have in terms of the established topics. So there's a whole array to include um, preconception health, unintended pregnancy, um, prenatal care, health insurance, uh, tobacco, cigarette use, um, 
physical abuse, mental health, breastfeeding, and infant sleep environment. But then we've had an array of new and emerging topics since the last questionnaire revision. So e-cigarette, uh, hookah use, marijuana and drug use, um, prescription opioids, and of course the recent um, pandemics to include Zika um, and COVID uh, as well as vaccination questions. We also have worked with NICHD to um, ask questions on disability and pregnancy. And we're in the process of working with the behavioral risk factor surveillance system to ask questions around social determinants of health. And that's in process now. Next slide. Um, so going on to the revision, next slide. The question that we would, so we're planning to update the survey con content um, and make sure that we have relevance and questions in this current environment, as well as other emerging priorities in maternal child health. We'll also be um, capturing priority topics across CDC, other partners and their stakeholders. And we would also like the opportunity to make sure that we align with national performance measures, including uh, Healthy People 2030, Title V program and other programmatic programmatic work. Next slide. So um, we will be following up with the committee in June um, to review the relevant topic areas and to discuss a few of the key questions as well as any uh, suggestions for further discussion. Next slide. So that's it. And again, uh, just an opportunity for the committee to be involved in this early on. So that's why I wanted to share this information so that there really is this opportunity. And as we know, with data modernization, we're also excited about the opportunity to see additional data linkages so that we can, again, better understand social determinants of health in the context of the survey. All right, thank you for that update. I'm just curious with the CDC statement last week that uh, racism is a huge public health issue, does PRAMS at all get at the racism issue in, in the questions that it asks? Yes, that is a great question. So back um, probably around uh, the 2000s, early 2000s, Dr. Kamara Jones worked on some work with BRFSS to do the reactions to racism module. And that was a series of questions that had asked um, respondents about their experiences on racism. The PRAM survey um, also incorporated some of those questions, but individual states decided rather than doing it as a module or component, they might pick one or two. One of the things that we're gonna be thinking about and discussing is one, should that be a core question or should that be a standard question? So we have three phases of questions. A core question is a question that's asked for every woman on the survey, a standard is that that is selected by the state and then their state-based question. So that will be part of the discussion, but the reactions to racism module was used by PRAMS in some states. Excellent. Other questions that, that people have or comments? <clears throat> yep. Hi, Steve Calvin here. Um, Hi, one Steve. Yeah, Wanda, thanks for your work and thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a question. Does PRAMS include um, previous pregnancy history, like whether it, you know, it's first time pregnancy, multiple or previous pregnancies and outcomes? Does it include that or is that in the birth certificate data? So it's somewhat limited and this is where there would be an opportunity for data linkage. So it does ask prior preterm birth and that's information that's linked from the birth certificate and it, um, and it may, of course, talk about uh, C-section, but um, it's very limited in terms of the amount that's asked with respect to a previous pregnancy, in part due to issues of recall, as well as the length of the survey overall. Okay. Yep. It's about yep. 85 questions on the survey. Great, thanks. Any other <clears throat> questions or comments? Either for Dr. Barfield or for Dr. Warren. Dr. Barfield, um, where is PRAMS at with changing the format? I know 
seemed like I remember there were going to be some pilots so that um, I know many of us struggle with trying to get paper versions out of people to respond to phone calls. Um, I mean, I don't answer numbers I don't recognize, so I can't yes. imagine people doing it. And I thought there was going to be a way to either do it as an app or a way that people could pull it up on their cell phones. Yeah. So, um, Belinda, you bring up some really great questions. One of the things that's sort of unique about PRAMS that might be a little bit different than other surveys is that once you find a mom, they are more than happy to share their story about their pregnancy experience. So the participation rate is great. It's about 90%. Where we have problems is initially finding women, perhaps. And as you mentioned, in these times, in terms of male survey, that may be challenging as well as phone at times, since we're all being inundated by phone solicitors. So we are one looking at different modes. So one is a hospital-based mode, which we did in Puerto Rico during Zika and after a hurricane and got a 92% you know, response rate for women and over, don't quote me on this, it was close to, I think, over 70%, close to 80% for their male partner, because we surveyed men and women about practices in um, reducing the risk of Zika transmission. So we know that, again, there was a lot of effort and energy and resources that went into that. Um, Bia Salveson was an, an incredible member of, in Puerto Rico who did that work, who's now part of the Brams team. We also know from other surveys that doing an internet-based survey, although it may have its advantages and con conveniences, tends to favor well-educated white women. And so in terms of the diversity that we see, again, for internet panel surveys, and maybe that's, again, the digital divide that's driving some of that, we, we don't see as robust a response rate in those, in those modes. Uh, phone survey, we do get a lot more um, African-American and Latina women who respond to the phone survey. Again, once we get them, and some of that may be also related to timing. If you can catch a woman earlier, um, you may get a better response rate. We're also looking at what we can do to have more representation in terms of making sure that there's a response rate threshold that will reflect representativeness and it may be going lower on the response threshold. We'd had a pretty high response threshold compared to other surveys, but we're trying to be a bit more flexible again, if it does seem that statistically it's representing the population. Thank you so much for that update, thanks. Great, well, thank you. Anybody else, any other questions? Just, just yeah, a quick I, question. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, I care. Uh, thank, thanks, Wanda. Um, just a, I know I noticed that like one of the established topics is prenatal care. Does that include gathering information about any um, fetal interventions, whether they be non-invasive or invasive, you know, such as like um, fetoscopy or fetal surgery? And I know that you know that's on the rise and becoming more, you know, that becoming more available. But I'm just wondering if you're gathering any of that information as well. Yes, yeah, so fetal surgery, you know, as a neonatologist, fetal surgery is fairly specific. And some of the congenital anomalies that are used in the treatment of fetal surgery um, is still, you know, it's important, but still relatively rare. And so this survey may not be the most ideal way to address those questions. We do know that surveying women on their on medical conditions of which they might generally understand, but not have a lot of detail, may not be as ideal. What might be ideal is taking that, that clinical record and then linking it to survey information, you know, doing it the other way around. Because again, mm -hmm. fetal surgery is still fairly rare. Right. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Warren, and thank you, Dr. Barfield, for those updates. Really, really, really helpful. Um, all right, uh, let's now uh, move on. Uh, and if you're worried about time, the, the next three parts of our agenda are really sort of fungible. We can uh, expand or shorten each one of those depending on, on where we go with our conversation because they're all really focusing on the recommendations that uh, we're working on to 
uh, get ready for our June meeting to, to actually finalize and get to the secretary. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have uh, Vanessa share her screen with the, uh, with the recommendations, the draft recommendations that I, I sent to you last night. And again, a little edited version earlier this uh, today. Um, and we can kind of kind of walk through there to see where where we are with uh, our understanding of these recommendations. The the recommendation I, I took the input from uh, the conversations yesterday, the feedback from the people who facilitated those meetings, and from the notes that uh, uh, the note takers took and had sent to me, and then organized it in this format uh, that that is part of the document. Uh, and then I, I arbitrarily move things around. So you'll see in the first section that is uh, uh, COVID specific uh, activities, there are some data issues that are there, but I pulled out some other data issues and put them in a separate section related to data. All of that, you know, when we're looking at, at COVID, um, it's sort of the starting point, as I say, and I, I, I put it just a little bit of introductory information in front of each section. I took out all of the uh, supporting documents, documentation that were in the recommendations earlier, particularly like the in the environmental uh, con contributions area. There was a lot of supporting documents, and I took that out to try to just to shorten this 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 document. Um, and and I start out by saying that that we need comprehensive reform. We this is a comprehensive issue: maternal and child health, maternal and infant. Uh, health and well-being is really important but COVID is a good place to start um, and that's so that's where I formatted this as a, as a place to start and so the first three recommendations um, are really basically things that we had talked about earlier that that we had agreed upon last uh, last June uh, so I didn't think that you know those would be, have a whole lot of discussion um, issue number four and five uh, are, are really data issues that, that could be put someplace else. And again, they're similar to what we had done before. Um, and then the eight, nine, and 10 are, are more research issues related to COVID. These are new areas. Um, and then I also, in one of the seg segments in the COVID section, there was a discussion about uh, we really need to connect with the rural health recommendations and the OMH COVID-19 recommendations. I don't know enough about what they're doing, so I could I didn't feel qualified to be able to write that recommendation. So I'm hoping that somebody who knows more about that uh, you know, will be able to help with that. But but basically, recommendations seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve are relatively new um, in our conversation. So I'm wondering if anybody has any you know any comments to make about those in particular. And you're certainly willing, I mean, the earlier ones that we've talked about earlier, we could certainly comment on those, but seven, eight, seven through 12 are, are new in this iteration. And a lot of it is about, you know, new kinds of research focus, um, like it's particularly eight, nine, and 10 in, in areas that, that we really need to look at what's going on with COVID and learn from this experience. Um, Ed, this is Belinda. Um, do we have, do we cover incarcerated individuals as well? Um, we do have in, incarceration in some of the uh, recommendations i don't i don't know if it's in every one of them uh, I, I know it's not in every one of them but i think um i mean i think about incarcerated pregnant individuals um and the and some of the challenges they face i mean we still have areas where shackling is occurring yeah and so okay. i'm wondering do we want to make sure we're including it i see it under number one for example mm -hmm. you think we might want to just use the term uh, disproportionately impacted or vulnerable and then give a reference as to what we need by it so we don't have to keep repeating it through the paper. Oh, that, that would be a good good idea. Um, 
I also had a question on language. If you scroll down a little bit. Okay. Which to which number are you? Would to you... the new new record, uh, the COVID. Um, okay. In, oh, identifying documents, systemic and social injustice responses. I'm not sure what a social injustice response, if that's a real term. But I, I think it's probably an important area, particularly with some of the Asian violence going on or violence against Asians right now. But it's just more of a wording issue, I think it's important. And then I guess knowing how that is tied to pregnancy and uh, infants is going to be important. But other than it, it raises a tremendous stress level and people are afraid to go out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that, that that when that was suggested, the person suggested that was really thinking about some of the the, the racial focused violence. Uh, also, um, you know, some of the law enforcement uh, interventions, um, you know, the systemic and, and different responses. Um, and then the, I think some of that, like eviction, that it came out in another one, eviction. A lot of people are getting, not a lot, uh, well, I guess a lot of people getting evicted. And what are the impacts of that on, on birth outcomes? All right, any other thoughts on, on seven through 12? And does anybody have the, the uh, expertise to write uh, a recommendation for number seven. Yeah. I can make an inquiry of the team that's working on the um, OMH World Health um, item. I don't have any connection to the OMH COVID-19 equity task force. I can ask for help if that helps. I, I don't have the expertise, but I certainly can ask a couple people for help if that. Yeah. So Paul, Paul Jarris, you said you are working with that group somewhat? Okay. I, I have been working with the OMH Rural Health Group. I know who's leading that effort from MITRE's point of view with um, OMH, so I can reach out to them and ask if they can find me help. Okay. Because this, this is a, a good time to raise the point is when we're done with all of this, I'm going to ask for some volunteers to take some of these things and, you know, finalize them in the next uh, month so that we can get them into to final form. So I'll be asking for some help. And this would be one where I would, would get some help. All right. Um, any other questions on this, this little section? All right. Then let's go into the workforce and care system transformation recommendations. And again, some of these things are ones that, that we basically uh, developed in our work last year on COVID um, and are now uh, being put together here. So they're, they're not new. The, although the, we, we've talked about uh, continued eligibility for Medicaid uh, the 1115 uh, waivers. Uh, we had not talked about um, uh, the CM, the number three. That's that would be a relatively new uh, uh, recommendation because <clears throat> the rescue plan would as a new issue that we had not seen before. So, any comments on on those three? I see Dr. Barfield has her hand up. I don't know if that's for this or the, still from the, from the past. All right. All right, uh, no, with no comments on that. Um, then then I, I had a, I broke all of the, the workforce care system transformation recommendations into different parts because it was a, a, large, um, a large area. Um, so the system enhancements, um, again, uh, the first three um, are things that we had talked about before. We had pulled out, I pulled them out from the COVID response to make them more generalized in terms of, of you know, uh, freestanding birth centers, uh, community team approach to uh, all of the pregnancy, labor, delivery, and postpartum care. 
Um, and then again, funding through our Medicaid. Those are our thing for telehealth. Those are things that we had talked about earlier. Uh, so same thing with number four, but number five is a, would be a new uh, recommendation. Um, and can I go back to two, uh, Paul? Um, we call out funding for telehealth. We don't call out funding for team-based care. And that's a challenge with global OB fees. So how do you compensate you know, the, the community providers who are engaged when the payment may go to delivering hospitals? and delivering position. Yeah. All right, so we could, well, are, you, are you suggesting that we add that? You know, that when we talk about uh, team-based care, adequately resourced or funded? Yeah, if we're gonna be talking about a, a, a care team approach, there needs to be a, a payment that reflects that. Yeah, so I guess we would probably have a recommendation that generally would be uh, uh, that healthcare provider, there, there should be a funding mechanism for different approaches to providing care that not just individual provider focus, but team focused care. I know that, I mean, sort of the accountable care communities or account accountable communities for health approach, uh, where they look at total cost of care. Uh, have funding that actually allows for team-based care um, that could be a, a, a model that could be used. I'm not sure how well it's working in various places, but <clears throat> that could be a recommendation. We can add that. I'll do that. Hey, this is Belinda. Um, two areas, one under Healthy Start. I'm wondering, do we want to say expand Healthy Star so that every community or in or metropolitan statistical area, because I'm not sure if we view Healthy Start as a state program, but it's more of a community program. So I'm not sure if I would say every state, no. because basically you're, you're looking at, it's a community level program. So I, I would change it to community. And I do remember at one point there was some data that there were like 300 communities that were eligible. Yeah. Um, right. so I would be cautious of saying state. Um, and then the second one is I'm, I'm looking for the language around, um, I think we talked yesterday and I think Pat brought it up around diversifying the workforce. Um, and it may come up in another area. Okay, yeah, we'll get the workforce development here in a second. Let's, I wanna stay on the healthy start for just a second. And okay. that was, I know you brought that up in, in, from the notes, I know that you brought that up yesterday. And so I just pulled this out of the air at midnight last night. Um, and, um, and so I, and, and I, I remember back in the day when Healthy Start got started, Minnesota didn't qualify because we didn't have a large enough population for uh, Healthy Start, uh, even though we had huge disparities, we just didn't have a high enough numbers. Um, so I'm trying to here to try to say, trying to get it throughout regardless just, and based more on disparities than it is on numbers. Uh, and that was, and then I, and I just arbitrarily chose 1.5 as a disparity ratio. Um, and I don't, and I think that might even be ac accurate what it's being used now. Dr. Warren, uh, what's the criteria now? That is my recollection. Healthy Start staff are on the phone can confirm, but I think when the last competition was done, which was 2019, um, in the eligibility section, it talked about communities with an infant mortality rate one and a half times the national average. So I, I that, that is correct. Although we um, have not fully like boxed ourselves in on that, we do allow other um, category or uh, other indicators to be used if the 1.5 either is a data point that can't be identified or if there is another way of identifying need. I do uh, want to point out that this is a decision made at the at the program level and not at the legislative level. So if the committee should choose in the future to want to explore um, how we are looking at what would be considered um, a disparity or a need in that area, that is, you know, certainly within your purview. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, I just use state and metropolitan statistical area thinking that you know, it could be, a, I didn't know there, I didn't realize there were no, st no statewide programs. 
um, that they were all more specific community focused. And I just want yeah, to- I think if, you, if you're gonna keep state, I would say state, community and or metropolitan um, area because you need the community language there. And you also, you wanna make sure that rural communities have the opportunity as well. And they right. may not be looked yeah. at high density area. And although the legislation does not specifically say you have to award grants to communities, it does include language about community driven. So community is a central point of the legislation. All right, good. So there's a consensus that we should keep this in with the, the changes that uh, uh, Belinda suggested, really focusing on uh, the state community and and or metropolitan statistical areas and 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 we'll leave it at the 1.5 unless i get some feedback from mchb that that's not uh, aggressive enough all right then um had a work a workforce development area and i actually had two some of that was more broadly and again um some of the workforce stuff was in in covid but i i left it there and here's in these three the first one is a new one and it was sort of what i referenced um when when dr warren was giving his presentation that uh, that resources provided through uh, the american rescue plan um, that are there to expand the community workforce should actually be sort of encouraged to target more of those who work with the maternal and child health problem, population, particularly vulnerable pregnant women and infants. This is again, trying to do advocacy for the MCH population in all of these resources that are coming to communities. So that would be a new recommendation. The other two, number two and number three, are things that we had talked about earlier. Any thoughts or questions about that? Yep, Ed, Steve here. Um, I think we could just reword that a little bit by just saying resources should be provided through ARPA to establish, expand, and sustain a diverse public health workforce period. Does that make sense? Um, we could, uh, yeah, should be provided through ARPA. And then just um, instead of the public health, just say sustain a diverse public health workforce. Yeah. And then just getting rid of the, and then just make a period. And then just the next sentence is the development of a community workforce should particularly dedicate for community health workers. Right. Just kind of a wording, a wording change, but it, it allows us to put in a focus on a, diver, a diverse workforce. Right. Yeah. So, so why don't, when we get some of the, if you have specific wording, I would really appreciate you just, you know, doing that and sending me a note with the, the word. Okay. Okay, sorry. Yep, we'll do that. That's fine because I, I'm I'm not very good at editing on the fly, and and we've and, got some time. This is doing a, a, the best job she can, but it, sometimes we um, may not be able to to keep up with that. Okay. Um, um, I think we're taking a very pregnancy centric and infant centric look there. Um, uh, what about? I mean, if we look at a life cycle approach, we have prenatal, postpartum, but we also have intrapartum care including family planning that we're not really mentioning here. Uh, and I think it would be important to build all those workforces if we're gonna have healthy babies in communities. I also want to second uh, Pat's note, uh, comment in the notes. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, so race congruent care. That's that's a that's a tough issue <laughs> right now. Um, but and I but I understand the the data that that point that out. Um, so we it, isn't, what isn't a difficult issue is the need to have more people, Pacific people, and other people who are underrepresented as providers in care. Right. Yeah, we, we need a, a diverse workforce, that's for sure. Um, all right, so Paul, Jarris, any, if you can see in this document, any places where you could add those other um, 
providers, particularly those related in the interpartum, interconceptional period, um, you know, if you could make some suggestions on where those might that might fit in the wording we could use, I'd appreciate that. All right. Uh, anything else with uh, this section of the workforce development? I'd actually like to hear from Pat directly. I don't feel like just the word diverse, because that means so many things. In this context of one, it's often professional diversity we're looking at. I'd like to hear. So, Pat, do you want to speak up? She's putting things in the chat. Um, Pat, are you muted? I am. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I think there, if you, if you, when you speak to women, right now, women are actually asking for race concordant care. And I think the goal is to create a system that is not only safe, but reflects the needs of, of what women want. So I, when I, when I teach students, I always say to them, you know, our goal is to make certain that you have all of the information and skills that you need to provide good care. But if you're not providing also the care that women want, they're not coming into the system. And our goal should be to get, to not only get women into the system, but keep them in the system. And that only happens when you have a satisfying experience. And women, if you listen to what women say, a satisfying experience for them, which is, which is part of respectful care and relationship building, are providers who look like them. Yeah, I, I know we certainly did that when OB changed from an all male uh, profession to, to now mostly female. It was the demands of women to being served by a woman provider. And I suspect the same thing uh, goes on with race concordant care. Yes, I mean, di a di diversity is a very, very broad term that does not necessarily achieve uh, the goal that I think we want, where we want to go. Yeah. And, and I, I, this, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking ahead. I want, I like the idea of what having a provider that, uh, that women have a choice of the provider that they have, that they would choose the provider most comfortable for them and that they have some options in those, in that choice. Um, yes. Yeah. We, I think there's also missing data though, to, to enable this system to be developed adequately to even achieve, achieve that. Um, because as you know, right now, if you were to look at the midwifery workforce, which is the only area on which I am competent to speak about, if you look at the midwifery workforce nationally, uh, only about maybe 10 to 13% nationally are midwives of color of any kind. So you're talking about black midwives, Latinx midwives, indigenous midwives, um, and so you, there needs to be data as to what are the limitations and barriers of either getting students in or once they get in, what are the resources necessary to make certain that they are successful in matriculating out. So I don't know that we have enough data on that and, and that would be an area of need. All right, so the two, there are two parts of that. We, we need to diversify the workforce and then we need to have a system set up so that women get to choose among a broader array of providers than they may have right now. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. That's a good addition. I think I'll try to work on something that would relate to that. And, and Pat, also, if you have any suggestions on wording, I would always, you know, always appreciate that. Look for help wherever I can get it. More than happy to. All right. Um, great. Anything else in that workforce development? All right, then let's go down to uh, this workforce development specific to doulas. I figure there'll be some discussion here because this is all new stuff. Uh, this is a new recommend uh, set of recommendations. Um, and there are seven or nine recommendations in this. Um, and uh, Vanessa, if you could kind of click on the, the in between the page and, and get rid of the stuff in between. There you go. That would double click there and yeah. 
All right, so any any questions? So these were um, things that that basically, from my looking at the literature and from talking with uh, a variety of doula providers uh, and what I know <clears throat> about the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and also my lack of knowledge about WPSI, uh, which I just I'm it was a deficiency in my education. Uh, that's where these recommendations came about. Um, any comments and thoughts that people have? I do. <laughs> so this is Jean Conry. Yep. Okay. So I guess one of the points that I, I'd made is not to detract from doulas per se. I'll, I'll have two comments. One is when we're talking about doulas, I think a lot of these recommendations are based on two major sources of information, the um, Cochrane Review from 2017 and Bargala's summary. And they looked at the service approach. So what um, the review was about was doulas, um, midwives, and I can't remember, I think nurses in extended roles. So they put together a number of um, different providers and said that when we have continuous care, a supportive system of continuous care, that um, they listed five different outcomes that improved with that. So rather than focusing on doulas, I think from a systems approach, it's better to say um, a level of care or an approach to care um, and whether that's satisfied by doulas, um, you know, two to one midwifery or whatever approach it's we're I don't know that we have to be prescriptive and then that's when I said that there's an economic basis that's different than this but this is if we're looking at the type of care it's what we're getting at my second comment and I'll um, I chair the women's preventive services initiative it was started in proposed initially with uh, Michael Liu um, when we first began talking about it in 2012, funded in 2016, it a, was a five-year collaborative um, to improve the health and well-being of women across their lifespan. And women is defined adolescence through maturity. Um, and we look at preventive health services, recognizing that we've got very clear recommendations from US Preventive Services Task Force about women's preventive services. We've got our um, recommendations that come about through um, for, through vaccine programs. So those are givens. And then we have the Institute of Medicine had nine recommendations that went into the Affordable Care Act. So WPSI was started in 2016, five-year um, program. It completed this year in 2021, and then we've been re renewed for another five years. As I say, it's a collaborative. So ACOG hosts the, the meetings. We, I think our... Um, leadership there does a phenomenal job of just taking care of all the intricacies of the grant, but it is a collaborative between our nurse practitioners, internists, family physicians, um, OBGYNs, um, and we've got uh, the Institute of Medicine group that sit on this. Um, we review recommendations that come from anybody. So certainly this group could make a recommendation that they would like something evaluated. And then we Put together all of the evidence. Well, we first look and see is, is it specific for women? Is, you know, is it something that we should be looking at? We have proposals that come through every year, and then we put together all the evidence. We use the Oregon Evidence Based Practice Center to pull together the evidence, review that in detail over the course of a year, come out with recommendations. We provide those recommendations to the Health Resources Services Agency, and then they act upon that. So my concern in the way this is worded is that um, we would never go to, uh, and Lee, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we would never ask um, the head of health and, health and Human Services to tell us what to do. We are the advisors to HRSA on what's the best medical care uh, and what is the appropriate care. So if you want this to be considered, it would come through um, WPSI as a recommendation. Any one of us can put that as a recommendation or the whole group can put it as a recommendation that you would like um, support, supportive services in, um, well, it would depend on how you phrased it during um, labor and delivery. Um, I heard women say they followed um, 
women for a much longer time period. So this group would decide what they would want evaluated and then make that as a request to WPSI to put it on um, their review. But it's not something I would say we would ask Health and Human Services to come to us and tell us what to do. All right. Good point. So it, it, this is Lee, if I can give a, 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 an element of this that Jeannie um, did not cover. So the origins of this were the, um, out of the um, Affordable Care Act was the desire to ensure insurance coverage for preventive services and screenings. So the recommendations that are made by USPSTF, by ACIP, by the Women's Preventive Services Initiative, Bright Futures and others, uh, must be provided at, at no cost sharing um, through private insurance plans. So, and the recommendations are not determined, as Jeannie said, by the secretary. They are determined by the committee with the, accept, with the acceptance of the administrator of HRSA. That being said, I think um, it sounds to me like the point that Jeannie is making is not to direct whether it is a particular service provider like doulas. Um, and if I'm wrong on that, Jeannie- um, No, that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, and so I do wanna say that the committee is, although ACOG is a representative organization of the um, medical establishment, their MDs, the committee is made up of MDs, nurses, midwives, midwives. Um, and practitioners from, from across the board. That being said, I think that um, there are those who are advocating for um, specific professions to be called out. That's a decision made by this committee as opposed to where, where WIPSI may choose to go or not go. Yeah, I think that's a, those are great points. And I think I went through um, some of our decisions or recommendations and the closest to this, and I, let's see, I copied it and I'm pasted it on the document I was sending to Ed, um, is around lactation. So we did not specify a lactation consultant or we did not um, specify who would provide lactation services. It's just that services would include a whole host of different uh, recommendations. So the Women's Preventive Services Initiative recommends comprehensive lactation support services, including counseling, education, breastfeeding equipment and supplies during the antenatal, perinatal and postpartum periods to ensure the successful initiation and maintenance of breastfeeding. So that is our recommendation. Then once we've got recommendations, we also have an implementation half of this group. So as Lee said, we've got, uh, you know, we've got the five groups that are organizing it, but then we've got a very large multidisciplinary committee that um, evaluates all the evidence, looks at everything from the National Women's Law Center, looking at coverage and everything. Then we take it to an implementation committee and the implementation committee says, how are we best going to go about implementing the recommendations and what's it going to take? Now, the implementation committee, the only part that HRSA is advising and um, does anything with it, and again, Lee, correct me, is we make the recommendation, but the implementation is how do we make um, this so that we are helping women in the very best fashion? What's it going to take from health policy? You know, we've got different insurance groups sitting around the table. We've got um, women's health groups sitting at the table, all of them to come up with a, a plan on how do we best implement. And it's unfortunate that nobody on the phone or on the Zoom even knows WPSI because it's a, a tremendous um, program that is meant to be like the American Academy of Pediatrics Bright Futures in looking at women's health and determining what a care is most appropriate and making sure that women don't have to fight for what their care is. That We would hear women could see one provider and be told what they receive one type of care and a different provider and the recommendations are different. This lays the um, playing field. So no matter if you're seeing an internist, an OBGYN, a nurse practitioner, the advice is the same. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, one of the reasons I wanted U.S the United States Preventive Services Task Force and WIPSI is because if it gets approved by that, it gets funded. And that's what I'm finding is that doulas are not getting funded. That's one of the issues. And I do call out doulas. I'm, I, as opposed to putting them into a whole race to, host of others 
because somebody has to advocate for them. We have not made enough progress. And from the data I've seen, they have a huge impact on disparities. It is one way where we can actually develop a workforce uh, in, in communities of color that could actually then grow into, into other uh, occupations uh, in the healthcare field. So, you know, I would argue that, that doulas are, are a unique service, that they do demonstrated from the data I've seen actually improve birth outcomes in a whole variety of other th factors, uh, and they can help reduce disparities. And we need to support them in any way I can find to support them um, at this point in time so we can move forward is would be a good thing. I don't see a downside to and, that. And this is, this is Paul, and, and Gene, I, I do know of Women's Preventive Task Force and, and have sat in some subcommittees and it's a very powerful and helpful group. But Ed, I think the difference here is this seems more like prescriptive advocacy than advice. It's up to, uh, unless uh, the, the duelists have already been, already been reviewed and are category B, then for us to recommend they be record, re, uh, reviewed as a category A doesn't seem like our place. Um, nor, and it's based upon that finding that benefit decisions and um, licensing and things will be determined. It seems like we're predetermining something and recommending it to a group whose job it is to determine it. So I, I'm very favorable. I'd like to see everyone have access to a doula, but what we should ask them to do is to evaluate. And if we understand what Gene is saying, the services and or profession, and if we want them to look at, develop and look at different types of evidence, such as evidence for decreasing disparities, then we should recommend that. But I don't feel comfortable giving them a predetermined conclusion any more than I'm comfortable with anybody else interfering with a scientific group. Right. So, so the, the recommendation for number in number two is really what I wanted to get at is, uh, you know, that we recommend recommend that the preventive service staff evaluate doula services as a preventive service. I can take out the level A, but just evaluate it. And the same thing should happen with WPS should uh, evaluate doula services. Uh, I'm comfortable with their evaluating. And then should that evaluation take it a category A or B, then all the following yeah. category. And if I would say we don't both do the same work. So um, if U.S. Preventive Services Task Force takes us on, then we're not going to take it on. We'll, we'll let them do it. Um, if U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and, and we talk with them quite a bit, if they say that we're evaluating this, we're going to go through the evidence-based practice, we'll adopt whatever their recommendations are. All right. We are a little broader than U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is what we found. Um, there are areas, let me give, for example, anxiety screening. Um, U.S. Preventive Services um, recommended, I um, can't remember what year, depression screening. We took on depression screening, accepted that should be a routine part of women's preventive health care, and looked at anxiety and said, one of our recommendations is we should also screen for anxiety. So we've expanded what U.S. Preventive Services Task Force does. So we try not to overlap. We adopt. If, if U.S. Uh, Preventive Services Task Force says this is it, then we're not going to do any more. They've done it. That's it. So they're complementary in some ways. Right. Can I, could I also um, address the issue too? Steve sure. here. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with that. I understand the concerns, Paul, that you have and Jean. Um, you know, but what we're seeing in many states, taking the data that's really pretty much, um, I mean, I, I, I know it from having been a perinatology skeptic of doula services probably 25 years ago, I would roll my eyes. Um, but seeing what doula service does. And we heard yesterday from Merlin and Ifua, who are both doulas in New York and gave us their perspective. Many state legislatures have already incorporated doula services. And I, I think maybe it's a little much of a stretch for us to say all women will be provided access to doula services. But the National Health Law Program's doula Medicaid project you know, the advocacy for and this is something that HHS through the secretary can say the evidence is looked at and obviously both your, you know, both the um, WPSI and, you know, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force will weigh in on certain things. But I, I would say the, the horse is already out of the barn that doula service is um, really clearly beneficial 
um, the continuous labor support in particular and Ed's point about the fact that uh, it, recruiting and training uh, doula providers, especially from communities of color, is an extremely powerful way to the introduction to care of uh, during birth and prenatal and then postpartum care. So I think we, you know, I, I, I think what we're, you know, what we're doing is we're trying to all, you know, approach this in yeah. the right way. But I, I would say that there will be great disappointment in a number of communities, including, I'd love to hear again from Afua and, uh, and Merlin what their perspective is, because I don't think they want to wait for another year or two or three yeah. until someone comes up with you know, saying it fits in a certain category. Many states, and then, you know, I, I think Belinda might have mentioned yesterday, New Jersey has already, especially for Medicaid service, and that's something that can come from CMS. So Steve, let me address that. I've worked with doulas for a decade. I'm not minimizing the work that they do or anything. I'm talking about a process in WPSI. So WPSI receives a recommendation or a request and we put it through our process. That's a whole methodology that we have based how we approach it, much, much like U.S. Preventive Services Task Force does. So all of those other sources are more than welcome to do what they're doing. If you ask us to look at this, we will look at it happily and with the entire team doing it, but we have a process that we will follow. I, we, if you go to WPSI, you can see the methodology behind it. We are transparent in how we approach it. We list all of the individuals and all the groups that work with us, and that's the process WPSI will follow. Okay, but I, yeah, but... I, I think the, the change in the wording is we'd say look at it, include it, uh, evaluate it, not Perfect. say... Perfect. You yeah, know, that's, that's the role that you play. That's what I was hoping to get at. Um, I don't even but I would say it's not her. So it's not health and human services. You all should do this. Ed, you should put that in right now and I can share the link. Yeah, that's that's where I, I that's why I want to talk with Lee afterwards. So, you okay. know, yes, the secretary to do some things, but are there things that we can do as a committee that sort of not go through the secretary uh, that just as a committee that we would say the committee looked at this and really wants you to evaluate it. Uh, as a as a preventive service, and maybe we should separate it because you know if in fact states are covering it's allowable under Medicaid under certain exactly maybe the ask pointing that out and asking the secretary to promote the incorporation of tools into Medicaid programs that's one ask the second ask is to have the two organizations review it yeah but I agree with that not advocating the organizations right. Uh, the other is uh, the essential benefits. I just put that in as a, a way to get funding. If it was an essential benefit, it would get funded. But uh, it would have to be if, if, if it turns out to be an a, a evaluated program that is it, it should be then considered for essential benefits in the, the health plans. Um, all right, so there's a lot of good input. So I can I can rework this uh, section as we uh, move forward. All right, any other comments from anybody uh, related to doulas? All right, then we went to the data assessment. And again, the most, uh, the, there are new things, the Maternal and Infant Mortality Review Committee be established in every state. Same thing with femurs, be mandated and, and funded in every state. Um, and then the other uh, are, I guess they're they're all relatively new. So any any comments on on these recommendations? So we've got for number one and number two. We in both of those we list infant mortality review committees. So is our focus to get them funded and mandated, or is the focus that one be in every state? It seems like one and two are some of the information. I would think that we want them established and funded in every state. Okay. Melinda, how well you want femurs. Well, I want to ask how well graded are maternal and um, infant mortality we use now. I know they're sponsored in different agencies, a lot of structural issues, but is that yeah, no, C yeah, CDC has been really working to try to get um, that's part of the erase, the enhancing reviews and surveillance to eliminate maternal mortality. They really have um, CDC is really focused on 
working with pretty much every state possible to establish a maternal mortality review committee. And what states are charged with is to have some version of legislation because you, it's hard to establish a committee if you don't, aren't able to protect it from discovery and have requirements to get access to the record. So I understand if you want to, you want, so it's, it's the establishment of the committee, but you also want it to include the appropriate legislation. I mean, because the committee established without having access to what they need for the abstractions of cases um, may be part of the challenge. Because we've had a maternal mortality review. We've been reviewing deaths in North Carolina since the 40s, but we didn't get a committee until 2015. So we were haphazardly reviewing them until we could get the legislation in place. So you, you may want to mention that part of it. All right, if you have some suggestions on how to include that in there, that would be helpful. The, 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 I'll send you something. All right, that would be great. Other thoughts on any of these four? All right, then to the environmental contributions to infant and maternal health. These were uh, basically the same um, the recommendations that uh, were discussed yesterday. Uh, I didn't really change anything from what we had the, the group had looked at the breakout group. Um, I did take out, like I said, all of the, the supporting documents and use some of those supporting documents as the introduction to this section. Uh, but did anybody have any concerns or questions about uh, these uh, seven recommendations? I just had more wordsmithing because I think it's important to point out that there is a, a great deal of evidence and research about this, but clinicians and patients aren't aware of it. So mm -hmm. I'm worried about saying that there's um, limited understanding or limited research um, and using those. So I can just send some wordsmithing um, around those kind of terms. Okay, good. Oh, the one thing I did add in here, and, and I didn't add it very well, was the whole issue of tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs. Uh, those are their environmental conditions but I just sort of plugged them in here and, and I read it over and doesn't read really well. So we And I would put that, yeah, I think that's where I would do it too, because on the one hand, we've got toxic chemicals and exposures, whether it's climate change or um, environmental exposures. And we clearly know that underserved women, um, Black and Hispanic women are most vulnerable. The research there is very, very extensive on personal care products, on pesticides, that they're the most vulnerable. So calling that out and you did in the, uh, the commit and implement stage. And I would say what we would say with drugs, alcohol, and tobacco, they are known toxic substances are currently well recognized for their impact on maternal newborn health. So you, they're kind of, they're in the same, I lump all of them as toxic exposures when I'm discussing them with patients. But on the one hand, we recognize more drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and obesity actually. Um, and then the, toxic exposures that were that we heard about in the presentations. All right, so we'll do some wordsmithing on this, Jean. And okay. uh, I, any, any other questions or any comments from others? All right, and then the, uh, the border health, uh, migrant and border health recommendations. Again, these were uh, what uh, Paul Weiss had worked on and what the uh, group uh, yesterday, broke, work up, breakout group worked on, and these were. I'm just, I just uh, cut, cut and pasted those from from that. Uh, so there are seven recommendations. So these would all be new. Paul, any comments? Paul Wise. No, I think this represents our discussion, uh, and I invite all of our group members to speak up if I didn't capture it correctly. All right, any other comments on this? No. Yeah, and this is one that uh, an area where I'm, I'm hoping we can really come to consensus in June to get it there. So because this is a uh, obviously a very urgent issue right now. All right, and then there was a whole variety of things that have come up over our two years where I have other recommendations that have been discussed, but we've not developed any established recommendations. Um, I don't know if anybody has any interest in elevating any of those issues into um, 
you know, recommendations that we would try to work on and get finalized by June. I mean, there, it's a broad range of things we know that impact a lot of economic things of tax policy, <clears throat> earned income tax credits, or, uh, you know, dependent care tax credit. Um, I, I didn't develop anything related to these because I think we already have a fairly comprehensive list of recommendations and <laughs> this could go on forever. But I, if, is there anything that people would like to, knowing they're all important, are there any things that you make a case for raising any of these to a higher level uh, for our scrutiny and work? Did we uh, include family planning earlier when um, I think Paul brought it up, Paul Jarris brought it up? Yes, I think, I think that was a good point. I think we do need to work on the family, the reproductive health uh, area and, and work that into the, both into the terms of the team approach the, the uh, life course perspective and workforce. Can you specifically talk about what you're talking, <laughs> the details of family planning? Can you give some specifics what you're talking about? The women have full access to family planning according to their wishes and values and best medical care. I know, but what, do you, what details are you talking about? What, like, what do you consider family planning? The, the, the range of, of family planning, so reproductive health services that are available to women in this country. Well, I completely reject um, the plan to put that into these, because if that includes abortion care, why would we include that into something where we're trying to, is that what you're talking, abortion care? Access to abortion? I, I think this is a field that is defined itself. It's not us to define, include, or exclude. It, it's up to the... Well, if it includes, if you're considering abortion care included in family planning, then I strongly reject putting that in. Because we're, all, we're a committee that's all about infant mortality. Adding abortion care is going to absolutely determine that you have a dead baby at the end. So I reject putting any, act, any inclusion of family planning if you're talking about abortion care. And family planning includes the entire spectrum of women's health resources, which includes access to contraception and abortion. If we don't wanna go there, that does not impact infant mortality. It's a separate discussion. There is evidence that it actually does impact uh, subsequent pregnancies. So no. that is, and I agree, that's a totally- Very well-reviewed area. Yeah, um, very well-reviewed area. So, so but um, I, I think, agreed we were not gonna have that discussion yeah. here. So, I, I, just, I, would, I would suggest that we put it in uh, the, the full range of reproductive health services in the next draft that we have. Um, and uh, we'll have some further discussion on it down the road because otherwise it is a long conversation that will be had. But I think that it is important. It has an impact on maternal health. It has an impact on infant health. Absolutely. I absolutely support that in any way. The research, the evidence is clearly there that women should have the full range of reproductive health care and we have the best maternal health outcomes if we do that. So I agree um, completely with that statement. I completely reject that. And if the, and if, and if the full access to reproductive health care goes into these recommendations, I will not accept them. Just so, you, just so you know, just so you know going forward. I understand that. I understand that. Um, and what we will do is that people can opt out of these recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that we need to have unanimity in these recommendations, but we do need to make sure that at, at least the majority, and I hope more than a majority, uh, support the various recommendations. And there's always a chance for a, a minority report. Ed, this is Lee. I'm going to um, just mention that the breakout rooms have been set up and there are transcribers in those rooms. So when you are ready to move those rooms, I wanted to let you know, move to those rooms we're ready. I'm yep. just going to leave one more question. Why would we allow access? How can you possibly consider that providing an abortion and killing the infant is helping infant mortality? I would like an answer to that. I honestly don't think anyone's talking about abortion but you. Yeah. You just did. You just said that it encompasses the full range of reproductive health care. I'm, I'm comfortable letting the secretary decide what that is. Yeah. All right. Um, and on the, um, the, the one around the uh, community health worker one, we, we have the community health worker one under 
workforce number one. So do you, I mean, it may already be addressed is what I'm trying to let you know. Okay. We've got to expand the public health workforce funding 100,000 public health workers to nearly triple community health workers. We included community health workers with the um, home visitors, the doulas, navigators earlier on in the document. We just okay. didn't put a number on it. Okay. All right. Um, so with that discussion, um, I want now want to move into our, our breakout groups for the three breakout groups. And I want you to take the members of those group, really look at these recommendations to say from, from the lens that you have, are there equity, are we addressing equity in the right way? Um, are there things that we need to add that uh, would enhance the uh, move towards uh, health equity? Uh, in the data and research group, are, are the data recommendations uh, appropriate? Do they cover the things that we really need? Um, in this, particularly in data and research, are there ways that we should maybe co collate those into to the same area or you know, separate them out under the topic related to COVID? Um, and then the quality care and access group uh, really look to see, does, does this get at the systems issues, the quality of care issues and the workforce issues that really will advance uh, the health of moms, <clears throat> moms and babies. Um, so I'm going to go into those breakout rooms just for, you know, to look at this <coughs> another um, uh, vantage point to see that we're not missing something or are there things that we should take out, things that we should put in or things that we should word a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come back uh, following that and figure out what the next steps are. So let's see, it is now two o'clock. Um, Let's go for about 45 minutes um, uh, into those work groups and come back at, at quarter to three. <clears throat> 